On this episode of Hellabiz, we're welcoming Chris McCoy, PhD and founder and CEO of today's Hellabiz Spotlight Company, U3D Incorporated, a design engineering and rapid prototyping company headquartered in Oakland, California. U3D is on a mission to help anyone transform a sketch into parts, prototypes, and products. Their global design engineering and rapid prototyping marketplace connects entrepreneurial leaders with key mechanical design, engineering, and manufacturing resources, helping them transform napkin sketches into real products really fast using this on-demand hardware-as-a-service model. Chris founded his company in 2014 and has since worked with hundreds of companies, small and large, including Autodesk, Cisco Systems, and Analog Devices, helping clients dramatically accelerate mechanical hardware product development. The rapid innovation cycle processes U3D at Founders have created has been adopted by leading university and professional educational institutions, including UC Berkeley and MIT. Chris, welcome. Chris, nice to see you again. Likewise. I feel like for you, I needed to study, so I, I actually have notes. I'm just saying, when you've got a PhD on the line, that's what you got to do. Well, higher and deeper is what that stands for. <laughs> we both have a Cal background, go Bears. I wanted to find out what led you to Cal, and secondarily, I wanted to find out what got you started on this journey into the 3D printing world. Well, first off, thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Um, so my Berkeley, my Berkeley experience started way back when my buddy, whose whole family went to Cal, said, Chris, you should go to Cal. Uh, it's better than all these other schools. And uh, so I applied thinking, what the heck? And uh, I got in. Then that started a long road of mechanical engineering and getting my master's and PhD all from UC Berkeley. Uh, and then um, I would say that the three... My, the 3D printer that came into my life in 2011 while on a Fulbright grant in Madrid, Spain, uh, is what really set me up for all of the work that you were going to talk about with U3D and everything else. Um, I was finishing my doctoral research on small scale fuel flexible engines. And I was also doing a small product development on the side, basically creating a small mobile phone tripod. And so the, our research lab neighbor uh, with a 3D printer said, oh yeah, come on by, you can print some stuff. But when they put that locking door between, and I was forced to stop creating and innovating, uh, it became a problem. And so from there, I said, I need to get my own 3D printer. And I ended up starting the business and the rest has been history. So when I first met you, you and I were both working with the Borowski School of Business up at the Dominican University on a 3D print challenge weekend. I was amazed that we took a room full of people who had absolutely zero background in design, engineering, et cetera. We're printing things at the end of 36 hours. You gave them a, a, a quick course and they learned how to use in about an hour and a half. And then they were printing things and going through a design competition with their results on Sunday. So we started on Friday, ended up on Sunday. I scribbled some notes, went from inspiration to imagination, to ideation, to innovation, to actually manifesting a tangible product that you could hold in your hand that you could take to, um, in their case, it was a uh, solving a problem for a local business owner and you take it to them and they see what you were talking about hold it in their hands and have that tangible manifested result of what they were talking about explain to me how were you able to accomplish all of this in one short weekend i appreciate you going through the full history too and the full path because it's often missed and i would say it's missing in most business schools today um, and it's missing in a lot of our own just educational endeavors because we always want to focus on the problem and we get started, but we never finish. We never get through the whole process. And so that has always been my goal as an educator is to really treat, uh, treat product development as an immersive process. And it's more important to get done and through it than necessary on the outcome, because you'll have time throughout your career uh, to sort of refine that and get better and better. But if you never get through the whole process once, you don't taste the fruits of your labor and you don't get that, that inspiration to keep learning more. So uh, the way that I sort of, I, I believe, you know, it's really all the students that did all the hard work and uh, gave themselves their own permission to get out there and create and, and be innovative. Uh, all we did as a teaching uh, team and facilitation group was to present them with tools that they were going to be easily able to pick up quickly um, that could help them put, you know, put some sort of form to what they had in their head. And then with 3D printing, uh, you know, it's an overused expression, but they say complexity is free. And so... 
they didn't need to have to really worry too much about design and manufacturing constraints with the exception that these little 3D printers can only print small things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, their creativity and their ability to design and create stuff uh, and then get it to be printed on a machine is, is always blowing me away each time I do it because I have my own personal constraints and biases like, oh, that'll never print. Uh, but these students, they, 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 they shocked us, right? They shocked you and me both. Right. Uh, they got a lot done. And I, and I thought there was some purely really exciting, innovative um, outcomes of that experience. And I, I don't know what, if any of the ideas went back into that business. Um, but we were, you know, thankful that they were all there to, to help support and fund that. But, and also to give the sort of the, the platform in which the challenges all lived in. Um, but uh yeah, it was, it's awesome to watch people go from zero to something in, in, a, in a short period of time. And uh, there's a whole fundamental reason why that happens. And I think it's constraint-driven innovation, right? Anytime we have constraints, we have to think cleverly. And it also sheds the ego, right? It's like the moment you think a, a task is impossible, it's like, well, I don't care if I have a PhD from Cal or whatever. Uh, this is an impossible task. So I'm going to give it my best that I can. And you end up doing a lot better than you think. So anyway, that's, uh, that's, I think, in a nutshell, what those students did that day. And it's always fun to watch them create. Really, this Fulbright grant back in 2011 was a moment of transformation for me. Uh, not only was I going to foster mutual understanding between nations as part of the Fulbright mission, but by going to another country, I was completely in a new context, a new culture. Uh, and so I think my mind was very open to change and to thinking differently. Um, and so while I was there, I was building this product. It was, it was called the Buddy Gripper. It was a silly cell phone tripod. Uh, but at the time, that was when iPhone original was original and just launched. Uh, mm -hmm. So I figured people want to have a way to put cell phones on tripods. And I needed a way to make that thing. So when I was in Spain, speaking my broken Spanish, <laughs> trying to articulate, hey, is there anybody with a garage here that has a CNC machine or something that can help me build this thing? I ended up searching all around Madrid, Spain, finding really nothing and had to go back to the university where I got access to their machine shop. And then that machine shop said, hey, there's a guy with a 3D printer in this lab. You should go talk to them. And so I talked to them. I started doing product development, iterative processes on design to 3D print a part uh, that allowed my 3D printed tripod to actually work and to show people the value of taking time lapses and taking photos, you know, by setting up your, your cell phone. But at the same time, that business, I would say, was questionable, though we've seen products like this now, the selfie stick and things like it. Uh, so maybe I need some marketing help. But, um, but what it did do is it also led me to realize that Spain had a, had a gap in terms of building things, right? And so mm -hmm. we created this course called Hands-On Rapid Innovation at the time. And one of the fundamental cornerstones of that course uh, amongst the tools and uh, uh, sort of an entrepreneurial mindset was the rapid innovation cycle. And it ended up being, a, a, it culminated in a publication that we published in 2012 right as Eric Lee Rees and the Lean Startup Method were, was, was published. Uh, and it was really applying the scientific method to business. And uh, we're actually in some exciting talks with some big, big pharmaceutical companies now. And we're going to update that, that, that conversation and update that publication because they've used it in a corporate environment uh, to really innovate. So, yes, it's very iterative in nature. And I would say it's now at the sort of the it's in the foundation of the U3D business models and also the services we offer because our clients trust us to help them come up with the new ideas and uh, the new solutions within the context of their hardware product development. So, you know, they obviously come with a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, insights as well because they're the domain expert in, in their market and their opportunity, but we come in with mechanical engineering know-how and really work hard to add a lot to their product. Without violating any of the NDA agreements you probably have with your clients, past or present, what's been the most interesting project you've worked on so far at U3D? Ed? What a great question. Uh, I'd say they all have had their elements of, of interesting features. And I would say we've also been exploring what's the range of customers we work with. Um, you know, I'd say that the most interesting project uh, is one that stretches our own boundaries and our, our, our minds of what can be done. And oftentimes, because our clients come in, they're bootstrapped entrepreneurs, people who are spending their hard-earned money and not raising cash in, in Silicon Valley, uh, they come to us because they have serious constraints, but yet they come with that passion, that attitude. And so the most interesting projects come because of these constraints. And we have to constantly rethink how we design and manufacture to enable them to stay sustainable and to get to their milestones. So 
One company I could talk about at Liberty uh, because they've been so open and so great is Backyard Brains. And that's a, a company that basically makes educational tools to help students K through 12 and even college understand, uh, understand brain science, neuroscience. And they just had several projects that all required advanced, you know, manufacturing and design, yet they had prototypes that weren't quite cutting it in the market, right? They had product failures and other things like that. So they relied on us to sort of convert their, you know, initial prototypes into more production ready designs and, and, and products. Uh, and in those processes, we ended up using a distributed manufacturing network to deliver parts right on time for their conference. And apparently they won toy awards uh, with that prototype that we delivered to them and that high quality uh, advanced manufacturing processes known as uh, multi-jet fusion. Um, and so just watching all that happen from like a bird's eye view through our online marketplace, uh, that's the kind of stuff that's exciting and interesting uh, and, and totally unexpected. I, I had no idea that brain science could be taught using a what they call the backyard brains claw uh and it's a, just a handheld device that probes your arm and then as you flex your muscle the claw opens and closes so um you know our job was to make that manufacturable and that's what we did for them for a long time we've been dealing with uh software as being sort of the sexy science the place that everybody wanted to go into it pays well and there were a lot of opportunities um, manufacturing design, industrial design, not so much. Industrial design didn't seem to be as glamorous and it definitely was not as fast as iterating something in software. With the advent of 3D printing, it appears that we have, um, you know, the ability not only to offer uh, manufacturing industrial design uh, more opportunity to come to market faster, um, but it also helps create uh, quicker, more sustainable, more viable businesses overall. And it also has a little bit of that cool factor that we didn't see before. So are you seeing much more of an uptick in interest in 3D printing? I believe more and more people are becoming familiarized with 3D printing. Uh, you know, more and more people are getting involved in CAD at, at younger ages and also in from different domains, different uh, industries. Um, and so that's all great. I mean, I, it, it's growing. I think the the, the stated uh, statistic is like 25% cumulative uh, average growth rate uh, in 3D printing. It's a $6 billion industry now, but has room, room to grow because the top manufacturing of metal company uh, companies uh, annually is, is, I think, $12 trillion. So you mm -hmm. figure that's manufacturing in a nutshell. There's a lot of room to grow for additive, and more and more technologies are bridging the gap from prototype to production. So I mentioned HP's multi-jet fusion. Uh, we have a partner in Carlsbad, California named Forecast 3D who uh, has 33 of these machines, if I'm not wrong. Probably by the time this thing airs, they'll have 34 and 5. Um, it's a multi-million dollar production facility, but it allows people to, to prototype in the same materials that they are going to produce with at, at scale. And it really changes the game in terms of the upfront capital investment required to bring a harder, hardware product to life. Uh, and I would say that that is a game changer when people understand it. Unfortunately, there's still a huge gap in the understanding of what it means to 3D print something and how easy it is. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have a job if it was that easy. It's definitely not a microwave level, like add 30 seconds yet. It still takes some hand holding, but uh, it is still much more accessible than plastic injection molding per se, or, you know, just, uh, you know, using shop tools and CNC machines. Uh, and so that is get, getting a lot of people interested in manufacturing uh, as, a, as a topic and, and hopefully inspiring the next wave of uh, hardware entrepreneurs to get involved because I personally believe, now this is my belief, but uh, I think that building things has been the closest I've ever been to really finding peace or, you know, some might say God or religion, right? It's like literally I've been in my most intense flow states and found the most personal joy when I am designing and building and creating things. And I think it's a human, it's a human endeavor to build, right? And uh, while you can do software and that's cool, I, I've also, you know, drank that Kool-Aid. Uh, it's a lot of fun building software. There's something about tangible, <laughs> tangible products. And, uh, you know, we, everything around us, even the computers we're talking through right now, we're built out of physical materials and just, it's a way to connect to the world and environment around us. And 
it's definitely a collaborative process. So we're forced to collaborate with people. And I shouldn't say forced, I would get the privilege to collaborate with people. If you were looking to go into this as a career choice, what would your educational background need to be? What was the, the kind of prep that you might want to have? Or what is the kind of prep that you might want to have? And also, um, and that would be more looking at the college side. What is it that somebody would do prior to college? Uh, you know, what, what would be the kinds of things that would be necessary for somebody to have an interest in or, or want to um, uh, experience before they get to the collegiate level? Well, engineering is, uh, you know, mechanical engineering specifically has helped me establish a very strong foundation for this, this, uh, this topic. Um, manufacturing uh, and manufacturing engineering as a domain as well is uh, very interesting. Right now you're focusing literally on the designs that mechanical engineers like me make, uh, how to make them. And you brought up Apple, and I'd say that Apple is kind of, uh, they've told me, like, I don't know, every time I hear you say additive manufacturing, Chris, it makes me want to like die inside. And it's because they have so many resources on design mm -hmm. and their designers are held up in such high praise that manufacturing has very little feedback towards design. It's like manufacturing engineers at Apple are like superstars because they have to make whatever has been designed by the Joni Ive style people, mm -hmm. turn it into life. And that is not an easy thing to do. Um, I think a similar challenge is like strategy and execution. So for any of you listeners out there who have ever tried to devise a strategy, if you don't know how to execute, you won't be able to devise a good strategy. And so what Apple's doing is saying, here's a strategy, go execute it and execute it well, uh, despite how poorly formed it might be. Now, it might be very appealing to the eye, like glass steps going up to the second floor to the genius bar. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so I say mechanical engineering, specifically around materials, around manufacturing, uh, but then also it's a combination of mechanical and software, right? Because the way these machines work for us is that they translate our CAD models into a set of lines of code and that code goes and it spits out plastic goo or metal goo into the right shape uh, to create our parts. And the, the, the dance between software and hardware is critical to get one you can have the best machine in the world, but if you have very bad software telling it how to move, mm -hmm. uh, you would have a very poor part, you know? Uh, another analogy would be like, if Google Maps was terrible at providing directions, but you had the best sports car in the world, you still wouldn't get there fast. <laughs> and conversely, if you have a terrible car, but great Google Maps, you still won't get to your destination quickly. So um, software we need, we need data scientists to help us understand the nuances of extracting the ideas that you have in your head and bringing them into some sort of tangible communication format so that designers like me or manufacturers like me and our community can help you execute your idea. Because as you know, I'm sure in the business world, it's very hard to articulate necessarily what you have in your head to what's actually going to be produced uh, in either physical form or even in a business service, right? Your value proposition, right? So looking at your website, and I was blown away by the number of services that you offer, but also the number of industries that your industry touches on or that you touch upon, to everything from consumer electronics to the internet of things, to military, to medical, um, you name it, it's pretty much all in there. Just a lot of translation across numerous industry types. So what I wanted to find out was, um, how is it that clients come to you in the first place? What is it that brings them in? Is it um, a price issue? Is it that rapid, um, rapid go to market ability? What is it that brings them in? I wish we knew better <laughs> as a business owner, uh, you know, so that we could double down on the things that are really working. But I, I, I think it really boils down to, you know, I've had a strong personal network here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, you know, people, you know, people seem to respect, uh, you know, the education that we have at UC Berkeley and my PhD in mechanical engineering. Plus, I think people have come to know me as the guy that's like, if I need something built mechanically, like Chris is the guy I need to call. So we've had a lot of organic and, and sort of just natural, you know, word of mouth uh, between my, my, my strong network here in the Bay Area. But, but when we find other people, I'd say, you know, we go to conferences and we present on materials and that tends to, to help us find like-minded individuals who are passionate about a, a hardware idea but don't know how to bring it to life. Um, my education uh, uh, activities through UC Berkeley and MIT and a handful of other sort of institutions uh, has helped us find, again, more people who are looking to learn about additive manufacturing, looking to learn about, uh, you know, hardware design and manufacturing. So they come find us and, and, they, and, they, and they, you know, they, if they have a product idea, they, they oftentimes will work with us. Uh, that being said, um, 
it's not always straightforward for people to find us because the words that I use to describe the, our industry are not how a, a layman, so to speak, would, would sort of talk about it. So I think we actually have a lot of work to do on our company to make it more accessible, even though for me as an engineer who likes to speak with accuracy and precision, uh, those are not the words that everybody uses to describe the things that we do. Like 3D printing collectively is now like manufacturing, right? Which is not true. It's a subset of manufacturing known as additive manufacturing. Anyway, I don't want to bore your audience with my, my nuances with, with technical jargon. But um, anyway, uh, I'd say that we've, yeah, we've got most of our customers that way. And then, uh, you know, they refer other people our way once they know what we do. And in terms of the services we offer, whether it's instant quoting for 3D printing and CNC manufacturing or uh, the design services, uh, we have um, really sort of a do-it-yourself model or we have a like high-touch, you know, concierge service uh, model, uh, which is built on a retainer. And so we, we work very much with whatever client size you might be uh, to help you get to where you're trying to go on the budgets that you have, whether it's time, money, and resources. Since 2014, when you founded the company, what has been the biggest challenge or set of challenges perhaps that you've had to face as a business owner? The biggest challenge for us is getting people to, you know, take a big bet on a small company and to come help us execute our vision and our mission, uh, which loosely uh, is to help people tap into their latent creativity for hardware designs and, and to create things. Uh, but then also in a bootstrapped fashion, right? There's a lot of appeal to go work for a venture backed startup. You get equity and, and you get, you know, some sort of salary and so forth. Uh, our bootstrap company has um, definitely been growing as much as possible with respect to the technology and our team. Uh, but obviously it comes with constraints, you know, without clients, you don't have revenue to pay payroll. And so the early years have been pretty difficult to sort of get people on board who truly are motivated by things outside of just financial well-being and uh, long-term equity. Um, so that's been very, very hard. Um, but, but at the same time, it's helped us find the right people, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody that's willing to do something without money and other strings attached tend to they're doing it because they're passionate about it. Their hearts invested. And uh, to me, those are the type, the right type of people we want involved in our business early on. Um, but obviously, you know, you know, as customers come in, people get paid and everything's life. Life is very good that way. Um, but, um, but yeah, other challenges have been, I think, you know, understanding, you know, in, in amidst a huge amount of ambiguity, which is the right direction to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at the early years too, I think we were sort of testing a bunch of different options, right? You know, whether we're, we're going to double down on education, or we're going to double down on automated 3D printing quoting, or we're going to double down on our platform, what have you. Um, and those choices are not easy uh, with, with limited, you know, limited resources, right? You, you make the wrong bet, you can run out of money, and then everybody's done, right? So um, we've done, we've taken a lot of small bets. It aligns very much with the rapid innovation cycle process. Uh, and, and I think overall we've converged um, in some sustainable business that keeps us going, uh, which is good. Uh, it could always be better, but it could always be worse. Those are the main challenges, really making sure we're constantly competing uh, well with our venture backed counterparts. I mean, they have, you know, I think at last note, uh, one of our competitors raised a series B, right? And that's easy in the, tens of millions of dollars. And so their marketing dollars and advertising budgets and making beautiful, you know, landing pages and things uh, make us have to compete at a much higher level in other ways, just because we don't have those resources. So, you know, I, I think we will always out hustle any of those people. And so if you want to come with us, even on a limited budget, we usually find a way to make it work for you. Uh, and so I don't know, that's just, I, I think we also relate to those types of people better. Uh, so I'd like to think that we offer those levels of connection and uh, product development process, which would be unparalleled. So Chris, what makes a great client for you? Any industry that believes that mechanical engineering, while essential, is it the core competency. And those are the best industries. One specifically is Internet of Things, right? Or Industrial mm -hmm. Internet of Things. And that's because really the heart and soul of any IoT company is the data that they're generating through their devices that they display to people like you and me, their customers, uh, in the form of a, a web page. And, and from that data, we make informed decisions, right? They're creating information for us to make better decisions. They're doing predictive analytics and, and whatnot. 
but the the sensors and the actuators and the mechanical solutions that are deployed out in the field or out you know in the refrigerator or whatever um those are essential but they're not like the focus of the business and so those tend to be very good clients for us because uh, they see us as the milk jug so to speak of the milk product right like we go home we want to drink milk we pour it out in the glass and it's in the glass and we're good the glass and the milk jug they are essential parts of that process um, to get the milk home and then to drink it but it's not what you think of when you went oh i want a glass of milk i don't care about the glass i don't care about the jug we want to be those people for you just like bookkeeping is an essential part of uh, running a business um but yet well you shouldn't be doing too much financial innovation because that can put you in jail but but nevertheless um you know, we, we want to be seen as a, a, a bolt-on mechanical engineering firm. And if people see that value and they see the value in mechanical engineering from that perspective, those client uh, opportunities work pretty well for us and, and for them as well. Chris, we've talked a little bit about the challenges that you faced as a business owner. What are some of the greatest milestones that you've achieved so far? I would definitely say like landing clients like Autodesk uh, early on and, um, you know, working with uh, schools like MIT who, who um, and, and Berkeley as well, but but I, I guess most notably, like I didn't have any connections at, at MIT really. It was I was walking down the halls and bumped into people and said, "Hey, like I, you know, I, I I'm a big fan of what you do, and I created this company, and I, here, you know, here's what I'm interested in." And next thing I know, a year later, we're, we're co-teaching a course over the summer uh, to you know leaders and and managers at some of the top hardware firms about how ad additive manufacturing. Um, will uh, will ultimately transform you know hardware product development and not just development side but also the production side uh, and so so those kind of things are, are pretty pretty awesome i mean i would say that that's been uh you know pretty good milestones um i would also say that survival has been a, a milestone for us right like and i don't want to say like you know survival just as a as a means to an end is not great but like surviving in a I would say the most competitive environment uh, on the planet for creating a company, um, to me, is 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 a is a as a milestone for us. Like we got mentioned uh, in the same line as Proto Labs, which is a five hundred million dollar a year company. Mm -hmm. uh, and while I, we're, you know we're not there yet, but the fact that we're mentioned in the same sentence to me is uh, by by thought leaders is is exciting, right? That's like that's like cool. We're 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 getting on the map and we're making moves. Um, you know, but I would say that our, our milestone definition could always be better mm -hmm. because, you know, it gives you a, a clearer focus. You, you really get your resources uh, aligned well when, when you have a clear milestone. But I would say that I've, I've constantly, even though we haven't hit objectives sometimes, I'm like, we've got to keep going. This company isn't too important to, to let, let die. So, um, you know, I would say so long as we're, we're making enough money to, to pay bills and to get people involved and to keep customers happy, uh, for me, that's what keeps me engaged and keeps me going. Chris, one of the things I'm hearing as I speak to business owners throughout the state is that it's an extremely difficult place to do business. From regulation to taxation, there's a lot of restrictions involved. So what's been your experience so far? This is probably where I shouldn't be saying things on, on air, but I guess it'll make it fun for your audience. Um, <laughs> you know, there are definitely risks to our current uh, operational state. Uh, and I would say we've always worked hard to have the best, you know, intentions with all of our um, activities in the, both the design and manufacturing space. I will say that whenever you're creating something brand new, most of the time regulations aren't well defined to help support your new business or your new business models. And so one such example is that we have a distributed manufacturing network with machines across 39 countries. So when you talk about tax nexus, for example, we actually... Technically, we have a worse tax nexus, right? Because we find local manufacturers mm -hmm. nearby their clients, nearby our clients. And so technically, where people are trying to save money by buying outside of state, uh, we actually tax you in every single state, which would require that us as a company be, you know, making sure that we're paying, you know, local and state taxes in every little place where we do local manufacturing, which is at this stage of our company, very cumbersome and it would take, you know, somebody's time way too much to try to figure that all out so there are solutions for it um but overall i would say like I, I i believe that any like regulator in our industry if they saw what small companies like ours are doing as so long as we have good faith and good intention to you know pay the taxes and do all these things 
uh, I think that they'll be lenient. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful anyway. Otherwise, again, maybe maybe the next podcast will be behind bars somewhere. <laughs> oh, no. Um, no. It's still possible, I'm sure. You know, it's, it's never, uh, never a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no, not a good thing. Uh, no, my, my, my family wouldn't want that, but um, no, nor would I. Uh, but all that being said, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's to me, I always try to take a step back and say, I have the lucky privilege to live in California where mm-hmm. we care about workers' rights. We care about fair and equitable living, you know, conditions, uh, at least stated publicly we do. And, and, and I believe that we are, California is a, ideally a role model for providing a, a good situation for, for work to happen, you know, for both sides, even though it's not always optimal for business people. Uh, but that being said, when you look at what's happening in Asia and also, you know, this whole, you know, uh, where the, this coronavirus, I know we're talking now in the times of the coronavirus, where that all manifested, it comes from likely poor working conditions, right? Uh, and our low cost, uh, obsession um, to buying things online at the lowest cost possible, it has its consequences. And it has its consequences because our middle class here in the United States has been gutted because we give all that work to now to other parts of the world. And now they're experts in manufacturing, right? And we're looking to them to figure out how to do things. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier with strategy and execution, if you don't know how to execute, your strategies are not going to be very good. And so, uh, and so you have to have design and manufacturing close by. And I think that California, although it can be expensive, it is a place where I think fair and equitable work can happen. And it, you know, I think it's really behooves us as business leaders to educate our customers and how their dollars and the purchase decisions they make influence how we all live and and work together. Uh, So that's my hope is that some, somehow we all learn that at some, some stage in our lives, but it's really hard to kick the Amazon habit. I'm not going to lie. Well, the good news is, Chris, you've made it this far. Um, so where is that you'd like to see this company go in the next 12 months, the next five years? Um, what do you see as your outlook? So the next year, our goal is to have enough people on staff so that way I can pull back a little bit from my, I would say, sort of high level involvement in the design of hardware solutions and, and you know, some of the you know, higher level manufacturing strategy uh, into really thinking about the company uh, as its sort of role in society and its role uh, as a, you know, a place for people to be creative and to express their creative ideas safely with our community uh, and, and really understand what's the right service and technology and sort of overall you know, ecosystem that needs to exist to, to make that happen and to really transform the way you and I uh, and, and everybody else around us uh, consumes hardware and uses hardware and develops hardware. Um, you know, there's this common phrase that hardware is hard and it's, and I'd say that it is in a lot of ways, but there's, it's gotten, it's never been easier. I'd say that it's never been easier today. Uh, and, and with services like ours, I mean, luckily people have said, you know, like, um, you're, you're the one of the kind place, the one-stop shop. And, uh, you know, that's, that's good feedback for us. So, so in, so over this next year, I hope to have the people in place that I can, I can sit back and, and actually be a little bit more strategic and less on the tactical side. Uh, I would say in five years, I'd love to see this company growing and, and being a sort of a, a, an inspiration company for the new engineers that are coming out. The ones that we talked about earlier that are mm-hmm. studying, you know, mechanical engineering, manufacturing engineering, computer science, data science uh, to come in and help us optimize what will hopefully be a, a vibrant and, and growing marketplace of design engineering talent and manufacturers who are ready and willing to help people like you uh, and and your audience and others to to create hardware because we've all had that idea right we've all been like man that was such a good idea and and you had it you had it a year ago two years ago and then somebody invented it and created it and now your opportunity is now lost and and you're like kind of bummed about it um and it's true that happens all the time but I, you know, our company believes that that's no longer an excuse. Like you can, you can do it if you really want to. It doesn't, it's not free, but it, it's, it's doable now. Mm-hmm. And so that hopefully in five years is where U3D it lives. And then long-term, like when I'm, you know, sitting on my deathbed and hopefully telling <laughs> my grandkids and maybe even great grandkids, hopefully interesting stories to compete with whatever virtual reality world they're living in, um, that this company enabled so many people to take action on something that they cared about personally or 
uh, a problem that they dealt with in their lives that uh, wasn't readily served by the existing product suite and that uh, they created the product online through our services, then posted the design online for people to consume and, and purchase, and then locally produce it on any one of innumerable types of digital manufacturing tools. So while Amazon Prime is fast, you know, at least it used to be fast, um, <laughs> you know, Normally. digital manufacturing could be faster, right? Uh, really, if, if, if the printer is just around the corner, at a local, you know, local uh, USPS store or something and just comes out, you know, you can have same day service, right? And you, you provided local jobs and local resources being used and you sort of embrace our design globally, make locally uh, sort of philosophy, which is uh, really helping the triple bottom line of sustainability. So I think that's the right way to do it. Um, and I hope that I can tell that story long, long you know, in the future. So Chris, in your facility, do you have a, quite a bit of a 3D printing equipment sitting around? We work hard to keep our internal tools to a minimum only because we need to supply our manufacturing partners with as much of the work as we possibly can. Okay. Now, if the, if the response time is slow because people are busy or the capacity is low on our network, then we have machines to cover that, that sort of time-based uh, demand. Um, and also it helps us to articulate ways to use the tools for our community in better ways, right? So we need to be experts in 3D printing and know what the latest and greatest is. Uh, and, and not just the latest and greatest, but also what our, our client base is using and our, and our network is using uh, so that we can better give them like tips and tricks and the best practices on how to get the most out of their machines. So we have, I think about, I think it was like 10 machines on site, uh, several 3D printers, a laser cutter, and then there's several, um, more traditional manufacturing tools on the bottom floor, um, but um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a collective workspace, and we sort of share resources, share tools, and it's uh, it's the right way we think to do manufacturing. Um, and so with our which are with our in-house tools combined with the digital manufacturing ecosystem that we have, I think we have over twenty million dollars worth of tools accessible. So even though these desktop machines can only print, you know, you know. X quality, you know, like 200 micron layers and, and, you know, whatever draft quality parts, we can easily take this design and send it to a partner of ours that can do it in much higher quality, different materials, uh, like metals, ceramics, polymers, etc. And you sort of build your way up towards success with, you know, taking minimal risk. Now that you know, this is a good design. Now you can double down and take a, a higher fidelity prototyping or manufacturing process. We only have so many materials and stuff in house. But if you think about like, whenever you brainstorm with a group, uh, you all have your own unique design space, right? Like you come with your experience and expertise, I come with my experience and expertise, and together we collectively form, you know, one plus one is, is some, something greater than two, a little bit greater than two, but if you have a collective group of people, it's like crowdsourcing, right? You have all these resources uh, in people's heads, but also in people's, you know, garages and machine shops. And so when I'm out of a material or I don't have a specific capability in one of my tools, I just reach out to my network and we're able to procure that typically pretty fast. They are also able to weigh in to designs and requirements on designs because for me to manufacture something very large on my machine would be quite expensive and require a lot of design changes. But if I have a machine that's already built for that design, then it becomes a lot uh, less expensive. So having the right tool for the right job is extremely important. And I would say U3D is well positioned to help people make those decisions because we know the design side, we know the manufacturing side, and we can help merge those two together. When we spoke um, a couple of weeks ago, one of the things you had mentioned is that you have some online courses that are about to launch. Uh, do you want to kind of give the listeners and viewers um, a little sense of what that's all about? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so as, as mentioned earlier, you know, there's are several gaps in this industry, and one of which is the education around rapid prototyping and, uh, you know, really how to help people suss out if a new product or service concept really has legs in our marketplace, right? And uh, so, so back in 2011, when I was talking about that, that little mobile phone tripod, what also came out of it was this course. Uh, and it was taught mainly in person at the local universities uh, in Madrid, Spain, and then and here at UC Berkeley. Um, but now, obviously, with, well, especially now due to, you know, shelter in place orders caused by, you know, this pandemic, but prior, even prior to that, we were already starting to think about how can we bring this material online? So what we're doing in the span of five weeks is helping uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, engineers, designers, 
uh, understand from a fundamental standpoint the rapid prototyping process as it applies to business. And we are going to cover the rapid innovation cycle in the first week, followed by service prototyping, then software prototyping, and then hardware prototyping, uh, all in a way to sort of reinforce that prototyping mindset, uh, a set of tools that will help you quickly execute, like 3D printing or like the Crazy Eights methodology for software development. Mm -hmm. And then we'll encapsulate that whole thing in like a rapid prototyping challenge, like the, uh, the folks at Borowski School of Business did in, in that 48-hour weekend challenge. We will do it globally online. Uh, and we will curate that through a number of online tools and through online live sessions. Uh, and they'll have content that's uh, watchable online, you know, independent of, uh, uh, you know, whatever they want um, on demand, like Netflix, but for prototyping. Uh, and so that's launching on June 5th, 2020. Uh, mm -hmm. It's actually itself a prototype. We are actually actively filming a lot of the content this week uh, and last week. And, uh, and it's, you know, we're excited to see that come out and to live online because it helps us understand what our user base and long-term, you know, clients might need to know. And if they can't afford our services, well, heck, you can learn yourself and you can do it, you know, better than me, hopefully. So, um, so anyway, that's the course that'll be offered online. And uh, yeah, there's, you know, online has is, is got a lot of opportunity. A lot of people are concerned that, oh, it's not as good as in person. And then as we're finding out, there's a lot of benefits for going online and we've always embraced that. And we have a lot of tricks up our sleeve to make that course. Uh, I think not only one of a kind, but maybe better than anything we've ever done before. Fantastic. Congratulations. I, hope, I hope people join us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's not without uh, a ton of support from our partners, which is at nodion.com. Uh, Atanas Bakalov, he's their founder and CEO. He is so passionate. I, I, I offer to say obsessed with, uh, online education and, and really, educational experiences that make transformations for people. Um, it's one thing to talk about, oh, I'm gonna learn how to do this thing or that thing. But when you make a personal or professional transformation, which is what he's going for mm -hmm. and who he partners with, uh, you really make long lasting impact on people's lives. And that's what our goal is with this course. And it's gonna be a work in progress, this first one out the gate, but I think that'll allow people to have a little bit of a legacy too, and to help influence and shape uh, how we see uh, prototyping education growing uh, going forward online. I think we're all a lot more used to the idea of having online education become the new normal. That brings us to the last thing that we'll be discussing today, and that is the coronavirus pause. Obviously, every business, every person has been impacted pretty much globally. And I wanted to find out from your perspective, um, what was it like for you? How did it impact you? How did it impact your business? And also, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to impact, for example, the momentum that you had going into this. And then all of a sudden it's like hitting the wall. What was that like? And then how do you see yourself pulling yourself out of this? Um, how long might it take? What are the steps that you're taking to move forward? So, uh, and, and, and your audience may be aware that, so as a 3D printing company, or at least we, we do a lot of 3D printing, we're not wholly 3D printing, but um, there was a very natural and on-demand response for 3D printers to come out and help with the massive shortage of face shields uh, mm -hmm. and other personal protective equipment that the doctors just did not have, uh, and nor were the manufacturers and their typical suppliers ready to provide for them. And uh, while that's terrible, and, and there was obviously lives lost caused by things like that, um, we don't want to let this crisis go to waste and we want we wanted to do whatever we could to help uh get our first responders back into as best shape as they possibly could to take care of all of us and so we actually i i believe it was it was saint patrick's day is when we sort of decided that we were going to start doing face shield production we we said hey look you know we have um we have some clients that that are, are you know are, are fine and, and everything's flowing smoothly there so let's put some of our resources towards making face shields. Uh, we started reaching out to local Bay Area fabricators in our network and to see what their availability was to make face shields. And they all signed in to sort of make and fulfill the demand that we were seeing here in the local uh, region. Uh, and so over the span of about 45 days, we I think made over a thousand something face shields, which is not a huge number, but it's, it's more than um, we had ever made before. And now we have like product labeling and, and these are, products that we sell online now for anybody that needs them. Um, so that was a, a fundamental transformation for our company to sort of become a personal protective equipment supplier. Um, but then, you know, more than that, um, I would also say it was indicative of 
some of the risks of a very traditional supply chain process, right? Uh, where traditional manufacturing can do a lot of one thing very quickly, uh, it can't make changes very fast. And when you have a pandemic, uh, people have to change and adapt very quickly, otherwise bad things happen. And so we saw that and uh, 3D printers rose to the challenge. And while they're not perfect parts, right? They have their limitations. Um, you know, some of our other, you know, folks that we collaborated with delivered over 75,000 shields, right? Through a collective network. Uh, and that's great, right? It's just that ability to, to respond on demand. And I feel like it's, it's in a sad way, it's helped people realize that digital manufacturing, distributed manufacturing has a real place um, and, and can really solve problems that uh, otherwise were given to like the traditional status quo machines. So, you know, I think we're always gonna have a place in our hearts for, you know, being there for first responders and for people who need these uh, protective equipment. Uh, we don't really want to be a, uh, you know, an FDA approved like equipment manufacturer, a personal protective equipment manufacturer, uh, but we'll help fill gaps for sure and, and do whatever we can to innovate on the design or to make these things better um, so that they're easier to procure long-term as well. Um, I think that, our company is naturally well suited to adjust to pandemics and things like that. Uh, any of your audience members know, I'm sure, especially if they're running bootstrap businesses, they're used to crises uh, mm -hmm. on a fairly frequent basis and uh, adapting to these issues, recognizing the realities and the truth uh, as quickly as you can uh, so that you can make an informed decision on how to proceed through this sort of treacherous place um, is, is a natural characteristic of bootstrap entrepreneurs, I would say. Um, it has impacted us, obviously, in our work facilities. You know, we have to have uh, maintain levels of, you know, social distancing and cleanliness and uh, just general personal hygiene that is at a level that's beyond what we were ever used to before. Um, also, you know, product development is a very collaborative process. And so it's much easier to go walk up to somebody who's helping you make something on their machine and show them, hey, this is working, this isn't working. Um, but now we have to be a bit more creative about it, right? Whether it's through a Zoom call or through using tools like Slack and other sort of online digital tools or collaborating that way. But it works for us that way, right? It's like a distributed manufacturing facility or manufacturing network can allow local facilities to do their work and manage their health and safety in their own ways. And also it allows us to crowdsource that information quickly. Like what are the best practices, right? Like you've got 3D printers, you're sending out parts to your clientele. So how are you best doing that uh, considering that you're shipping parts that you've touched? And so, you know, we, we've, you know, through a, a community, like people are posting and they're talking about, well, we take, you know, some you know, percentage of bleach and we mix it with the, another percentage of water, you know, with some water and we can use that to sort of sanitize parts and ship them out in a, in a meaningful way. And so all that is, um, I think are necessary and essential steps, but it's a, it's a learning process as always, just like product development is you got to, make something, test it on your unforgiving marketplace and learn from that feedback and come back to the drawing board. And so, you know, pandemics are, are no exception. We constantly adapt into this little beast of a virus. And I think, you know, collectively as a society, we'll beat it as long as we listen to truth and we, uh, you know, we allow to find our leaders that we trust uh, and follow their, their guidance, but also be a leader yourself. And in absence of clear direction, use your heart and your head to, to make good choices about protecting our fellow neighbors and brothers and sisters. Because we're providing essential services around protect, you know, protective uh, equipment, uh, I believe we were, you know, phase one, well, I guess we'd be at phase one. I mean, there were SISA guidelines that we were following for, for some uh, parts of components, but um, that's all coming out. So I think I think we're like phase two now. That's going to be what we tell people. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think manufacturing in general on the whole has been an essential service. And we weren't making like, we definitely have not been prioritizing like consumer goods that are, you know, for out having recreational activity. It's, it's, I think it's been all hands on deck and you can look at our website today and you can see that our main above the fold aspect of our webpage is all dedicated to COVID-19 and accelerating um, the end of this, uh, this, pan this, this virus, right? And uh, we believe in that wholeheartedly and we'll continue to serve any demand that comes our way. But as demand subsides, hopefully for good reasons, uh, we're gonna go back to business, uh, business as usual, which is you know, making and designing parts, but it won't be in the same way, so to speak. Uh, we will be using all the new and best known practices of staying safe and healthy. Um, and um, 
and yeah, we, we have, we have everybody working remotely at, at the moment. Uh, we have regular huddle check-in calls using Google Hangouts and, 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 uh, and, and Zoom and uh, all of our courses are now taught via Zoom and all that stuff. So we've been, you know, the silver lining is that we get to be at home and closer to the family. In the Bay Area, as you know, I believe uh, the commutes here can be horrendous at certain times. So we've been very lucky to avoid commute, commute issues. Um, and so, you know, we're going we're gonna to take it as, as in strides and do whatever we can to help people get out of this mess. Uh, yeah. But it's really been... I don't know. I, I guess the last thing I'll say about this has been, it's truly been remarkable to see who's risen to the challenge and mm -hmm. how many people have uh, come together to really connect and to solve this, you know, really this humanitarian crisis. And um, it's, it's awesome. And, and I wish there were more people who didn't just see this as like, Oh, I'm bored. What do I do? Um, but that's okay. It's, you know, a lot of people figure out how to get through this in their own ways. But for those who have, gone the extra mile and have done the heroic stuff. I mean, kudos to them. And you, they're why we work as hard as we do to provide face shields. It's, we gotta, we gotta be part of this fight together. So I hope that's what I would, I guess, ask from anybody listening is that, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so find a way to help out, you know, there's going to be local initiatives around you. You just got to do a couple of Google searches with your area code or your city and there'll be something around. And if you're lost, uh, you can contact us at youth Media, and we'll help find something for you to do. Uh, there's plenty of ways that you could help with our PPE efforts, I'm sure. But I think it's a terrible experience and, and we're still getting through it, but I, I like to believe that we'll come out of this better on the other end. Chris, thank you so much for being a guest and it's been a pleasure having you on today. Um, I think that we'll definitely want to try and keep in touch with you over the next six months to a year to find out how things are shaping up for you. And, um, uh, it's a hell of biz that you got going there. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Julia, for your time. And it was a pleasure to be here with you.